Good afternoon and thanks for joining us, I'm Keith Silva. Farming and technology go hand in hand. Satellites and digital devices are replacing pen and paper the same way tractors replace teams of horses. The term for this latest technological advance is precision agriculture. Farmers have always been early adopters of new technology and precision agriculture is no exception, as I found out at the first annual Precision Agriculture Forum in St. Albans. For most of us, a snowy field makes the growing season feel far off. For farmers, it's a time of preparing and planning. Part of today is is very traditional extension venue where we show farmers that here's another farm that's doing this. Wintertime is when many farmers have a minute to learn what's new, what's next, and what works. One topic that has many farmers' attention nowadays is precision agriculture. Precision ag is just what it sounds like. It's being very precise about uh, field management, feed management, using technology to be able to do that. Heather Darby is a University of Vermont Extension agronomist. UVM Extension, along with the Farmers Watershed Alliance of Grand Isle and Franklin Counties, are co-hosting this Precision Agriculture Forum. Really, for the first time since we've started working in this area, it feels like we have um, enough interest from the farming community and industry, too, um, service providers that are around working with farmers, equipment dealers, to actually start moving Precision Ag even further um, in the state of Vermont. It was really Precision Ag isn't a practice that most farmers felt that they would be able to utilize because our fields are so small um, and we're so remote. The technology actually wasn't always really available for us, but now people realize regardless of your farm size, you could be implementing precision technology, could be helping you save money. So the interest is there, hence we're having a conference and learning forum to help, you know, elevate people's knowledge in this area and hopefully, you know, see broader scale adoption in the future. What tractors were to farmers in the early 1900s, precision agriculture is to today's farmer. A cell phone or other handheld device enabled with GPS technology can be used to auto steer equipment, vary rates when spreading nutrients, or program to the gram an animal's rations. The data that's collected is used in a farm's management. We had some good coverage. That was, that's Scott Magnum owns a crop services business. He's been offering precision agriculture services since 2011. He admits there's a learning curve to the technology. You're going to have to have some basic computer skills. Um, I mean, most people are pretty comfortable with a with an iPhone, and a lot of the displays are uh, similar to iPhones. What you're going to need help with is the setup to make every make sure everything is organized in the display. Um, have some knowledge of how to get that data off off the display, what to do with it afterwards. So there's a there's a process there that you need to learn. It's not just throw it in the in the tractor and and go. Inputting data directly into the computer allows farmers to access information in minutes instead of days. This allows Magnin to provide customers with up-to-the-minute information to manage their operation. Being able to have a, a nutrient management planner message me at 4 o'clock in the afternoon and being able to have his records to him by 5 o'clock. When we first started, we, it would take uh, three or four days to uh, try and look back at old handwritten records, uh, call operators to see what field was spread when, when it wasn't written down, and now it's, it's just, it's electronically recorded. Precision agriculture comes with a cost. A manure spreader can retail for as much as $70,000. A piece of precision ag equipment, like a flow meter, that's used to spread manure at variable rates, increases the cost by about $15,000 which doesn't include other costs, like software and training. Farmers Watershed Alliance is co-hosting this event. The Alliance helps farmers network, provides technical assistance, and finds funding for projects aimed at improving water quality. Catherine Davidson is the program coordinator. 
Precision ag is really big, and we see that as a growing industry in Vermont, um, especially with the funding coming out. There's a lot of funding available right now for different precision agriculture technologies. So having a day like today is great because it, you know, people that maybe are thinking about transitioning some of their practices or um, or products to this, they can kind of like figure out who to talk to and learn a little bit more about that and how to get started. Be a lot more accurate. Tim Magnet owns Bridgeview Farm in Franklin. He's been using auto steer on his tractor for about a year. The technology allows almost no overlap when he's planting, which saves time, money, and reduces stress. It's fairly new, but I'm learning, and, it, and it, the more I learn, the more I like it. There's, there's some, like everything, there's advantages and disadvantages that you, that you didn't realize when you purchased it. Mostly it's been advantages for me, and I'm really enjoying that part of it. One of the things when you go back to the auto steer, it's taken a lot of the stress out. I mean, I noticed at the end of the day, a long day of planting, that I felt a lot more upbeat, a lot fresh, not, not as, as tired and, and wore down. Magnet milks about 120 cows and crops 190 acres. That's a relatively small amount of land, given that Precision Ag technology was developed for farms 20 times that size. What using Precision Ag comes down to for Magnet is protecting Vermont's natural resources. It's gonna help us all the way around. It's economics, a big driver, of course. The water quality is almost as big a driver today or is a biggest driver today. I've always been proactive in the water quality. I've put my buffer zones in. I've got wa grass waterways. I perceive our image as, as being big. I, I'll agree with people that say, we're gonna have the water quality issues. We can't correct those overnight. We can't fix the lakes and the algae blooms. Those aren't gonna be fixed next year or the year after. Those are a long process to fix. We're working towards it. I think we need to be patient and work towards those. I don't think we should be pedaling backwards. I'm not, I'm not saying that at all. But I think we do need to move forward, but I think we've got to do it cautiously, and I think we've got to do it, be proactive and do it. And I think you'll find on my farm we're doing that. Nobody's saying precision agriculture is the solution to Vermont's issues with water quality. What it does offer is another way for farmers to keep phosphorus and other nutrients in the ground where they belong. We all realize that being able to better manage nutrients will help us also protect the environment. So there's a lot, you know, a lot of support available for folks now. Um, and now, you know, knowledge too. You know, Extension has been able to build a knowledge base in this area, but also be able to connect with other folks in the region to be able to bring the right information we need to farmers so that they feel confident in making these kind of decisions on their farm. Better decision making, cutting edge technology, and protecting resources for future generations. That's farming in the modern age, precisely. The 2019 Precision Agriculture Forum is being held on Friday, February 15th at the Abbey Pub and Restaurant. This event is an opportunity to connect with vendors and learn from farmers who are already using this technology. Tickets are $15, which includes lunch. Please go to the website on the screen to register. Our next story focuses on a big problem you can barely see on the shores of Lake Champlain. Smaller than a grain of sand and no longer than a pencil eraser, this threat endangers the wildlife and water quality of the lake. Rebecca Gollin has our story. There's a mystery in Lake Champlain. Is it a film? Is it a bead? Is it a fiber, fragment, foam? It is tiny pieces of plastic that researchers started noticing in the early 2000s, first in ocean waters and later in the Great Lakes and Lake Champlain. These particles are less than five millimeters in size. That's smaller than a pencil eraser. The first project and probably the longest running was the wastewater treatment plant processing. So Danielle um, Garneau is a professor of environmental science at SUNY Plattsburgh. She's leading a study investigating the distribution of the plastic particles, or microplastics, around the lake, both in the water and also in the animals who live here. We've got invertebrates, uh, macroinvertebrates. We've got 14 species of fish, and our top predator would be the cormorants. Um, and so these are all the lake species we worked with, about 19 species, 14 species specifically are, are fish. The research started several years ago, testing water that was treated at the local wastewater treatment facility. 
We started doing uh, wastewater treatment plant surveys at the Plattsburgh City Plant. Um, we basically will go out with a 355 micron um, sieve and we'll place it under um, a hose that's pulling water from the last um, portion of processing at a plant right before it goes out into the lake. The study recently expanded from Plattsburgh to include wastewater treatment plants in Burlington and St. Albans, with Garneau's team taking samples weekly at each location, as well as several sites within the lake. As you can see from these pie charts, we're getting a lot of fragments. So that's an orange here. Um, and this is 2015 and 16 samples. One concern is that accumulation of the microplastics in larger fish and predators will have a negative impact on their health. A lot of these plastics have plasticizers and other um, additional you know, additives, the BPA, um, and so on, and those things, are they, are they leaching out into the other tissues, making it through the bloodstream um, and impacting you know, neurologically? And again, findings, early findings in, in many organisms are showing some signs that these aren't necessarily a healthy thing for these organisms. Another piece of the puzzle is determining exactly what kind of plastic each tiny particle came from in the first place. There's so many thousands of kinds of plastics uh, that are out there, different polymers, mm -hmm. different types of plastics. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the meander is really that, that S shape yeah. that, that rivers are going to create. Slowing Chris Stepanuk is a professor so and researcher at the are, University are, of Vermont. She's part of the Lake Vermont, Champlain Sea Grant, which is funding Garneau's research on microplastics. What Danielle is finding is that the dominant kind of plastics or microplastics in the lake are fibers. So those are coming from textiles, maybe like our fleece jackets, or from ropes or other uh, plastic materials that are used in the lake or fishing or something like that. Um, and then we also know that she's looking at wastewater treatment plant outfalls and that these microplastics are making their way through the wastewater treatment plants and out into the lake. Garneau's team is also going back to older lake water samples to figure out exactly when the different microplastics started showing up. Knowing the time frame will help them identify where some of the particles are coming from. One source researchers have pinpointed is washing machines. One of the things that we've learned through different research studies is that different kinds of materials, and this is again the fibers being the most prevalent in Lake Champlain, um, when they're washed, they're shedding off pieces of, of plastic, uh, and that's getting again through the wastewater treatment system and out into the lake. The wastewater treatment facilities are not doing anything wrong. They're simply not set up to deal with such small particles. And while a few fibers getting free during a wash may not seem like a big deal, studies have shown that an average size load of polyester cotton blend could release an estimated 137,000 fibers. Acrylic material, one of the worst offenders, can shed over 700,000 of the microscopic plastic fibers per load. You know, even though when we look at our sieve, when we pull it, it doesn't seem like a lot. You can imagine when we, you know, extrapolate out to, based on flow rates and many thinking about other plants that would be contributing as well, um, this, may, this may become a, a larger problem in the lake. So what can we do? So what we can do is a few things. One is thinking about using fewer plastics. So what kinds of, of action might we have in our lives that uses plastic? Uh, we go to the grocery store. Maybe we don't use the plastic bags. Um, those are films, uh, which would be called plastic microplastic films of a plastic bag bag breaks apart. Uh, she's not seeing those in huge numbers, uh, but that's still an action we can take. There are some products hitting the market that address the problem, like Patagonia's Guppy Friend washing bag and the Cora Ball from the Vermont-based Rosalia project. Long-term solutions could include working with washing machine manufacturers and retrofitting wastewater treatment plants to capture the smaller particles. So in terms of um, what our role can be, you know, just choosing to use um, alternatives or less plastic, you know, don't use the straws, 
um, switch over to more natural products when we're choosing face wash and toothpaste. You know, be a more aware consumer. That certainly is one of them. Maintenance, maintenance of our um, outerwear and our synthetic clothing. Um, and uh, also, if we're if you um, are out on the lake a lot, you know, making sure that your equipment is up to speed and you're not working with frayed ropes and, and those sorts of things. Solving a mystery and rethinking our relationship with the plastic we use and wear. Can we win the war on microplastics? It's going to be challenging. These researchers are up for the challenge and on the case. In Burlington, I'm Rebecca Gollan with Across the Fence. Thanks, Rebecca. As we say goodbye, I want to thank everyone here at WCAX for making today's program possible. And as always, thank you for stopping by Across the Fence. Across the Fence.